Amen. All right. So Proverb 23, 23, that's our verse tonight. And it says, the, um, well, I've got to be in the right chapter here, sorry. It says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. So there I was Monday morning reading my Bible in, in devotion time and in prayer with the Lord and reading Proverb 23. What do you know? Because it was the 23rd on Monday. And uh, this is how I came to it. Just reading. And then, because uh, I have a notebook that I usually have open that, uh, to take notes. But, hey, you know, I, I read a proverb a day, so I guess I don't need my notebook that morning. And then the Lord reminds me, what's it there for? If you receive instruction, what are you going to do? Because I like to deceive myself many times to think I'll remember things that he teaches and things that he gives. And two hours, one hour, maybe even ten minutes go by and it's whew, gone. <laughs> so I open my, my notebook and, and come back to Proverb 23 again. And, and really struck by this verse, buy the truth and sell it not. And also wisdom and instruction and an understanding and and by the truth you, know, you think well is truth important that's an easy question I think we could all uh, readily answer that yes truth is important is truth absolute yes it's absolutely true uh, because if it's not true well then simply not true uh, you have truth and you have non-truth and no gray area in the middle even though we like to try to treat truth with relative importance because we try to fudge and try to find gray areas to get away or to make ourselves feel all right to, about those sort of things but if we keep it really simple things go a lot easier i believe now uh, i started reading Pilgrim's Progress again uh, a short while ago and there, if you've never read it before there's a scene uh, where they enter into Vanity Fair this town called Vanity Fair you have Christian and Faithful two pilgrims on the way to the celestial city and Vanity Fair was filled with all the things of the uh, world all the the temptations everything as they're uh, walking through it trying to sell all those things and this is their this is what they said as they're walking through this town turn away my eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way as they were uh, crying out to the Lord that they wouldn't look upon all the earth's temptations and and be drawn away from those things and people are trying to sell all those things that they have and finally someone spoke up to these two because it caused quite a stir as they came through town and they said what would you buy and their reply was, we buy the truth, referencing this verse. We buy the truth. And then from that point is when they, they grabbed them and they started roughing them up, the scoffing, mocking, and uh, doing all that. And then uh, faithful was burned at the stake after they gave him a, a, a false trial. But because they desired to buy the truth, only have eyes for the Lord, only have eyes for his word, his truth, then all hell breaks out in that chapter, really. And so you come to this and, and think, buy the truth. What an interesting, at least to me, phrase, buy the truth. And I don't know how many times I've read Proverb 23, 23, but never really being captured by that verse. And I believe uh, the Lord has three great truths for us to learn here tonight. And, and I give them to you free. Otherwise, maybe... Since the going rate around here is three dollars, maybe a dollar a truth, and you have to buy them all, so then it equals three dollars. <laughs> but maybe not. I don't know. You can decide on it later. But three great and simple truths. If we learn these, I think I think things will go well. So, great truth number one. And I'll read it slow so you can write it down. There is a God. That's great truth number one. There is a God. Great truth number two. You are not him. I am not him. We are not him. So the two and, and the third will come later. Don't think I haven't forgotten it, but uh, you'll just have to hold off for that one. So there is a God and you are not him. If we get that, 
Things go a lot smoother, I think. But anyways, by the truth, you know, you'd think it would be free, right? You'd think, why, why would I have to come and buy this thing? It's really, it's right before our eyes, is it not? But by the truth, and why? Well, that pretty simply, God says so. So now let's try to understand and, and unpack why is he saying, buy the truth and sell it not? Why would John Bunyan in the 1600s use this in his uh, great story about uh, Christian on his way to uh, the celestial city? So, come to this, and I, and I write this verse down in, in my devotions and, and write some questions that go with it. Why should I buy the truth? How do I buy it? And what does it cost? Because if I'm being told to buy something, typically there's a cost that goes with it, right? So, why should I buy the truth? Again, we go back to that simple answer because God says so, right? He says buy the truth, so that pretty much sums that up. But let's look into it a little more. Let's look at it from the negative side point. What does it look like without the truth in the world? Now, that's pretty easy to answer because if you've looked outside today, you can see the answer what life is like without truth. How people live that out. Read the news, watch the news, watch what people do, look how they treat each other. Um, not good. You know, people nowadays can't even look in the mirror and see the truth that's reflecting back to them and think that there's something different. We live in a bizarre world because they've rejected the truth. God even says in Jeremiah, uh, you've rejected wisdom. What wisdom do you have? What is there? What is there without truth? But it's easy to look at the world and see how it's gone mad and crazy and all that. But let's look within, within ourselves, within the church. What does it look like when we decide to walk without truth? You know, what happens when you try to serve two masters? What happens when you accept some truth but want to reject some other truths? Self-deceived. So we're going to turn a few places in the Bible here. So if you're ready, Isaiah 59. And look at Israel that had rejected the truth. How did they look? Isaiah 59, starting at verse 9. It says, Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we uh, grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn soar like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation. But it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Now at this time when Isaiah is uh, prophesying to the nation of Israel, guarantee that the majority of people would say that they were walking in God's commandments. They were still going to temple, they were still bringing sacrifice, but yet what was happening? They were lying. What's John say in 1 John? If you say that you have the light but you walk in darkness, you transgress, well, the truth is not in you and you lie. We see that picture right here as, as the darkness was over there. But yet, everyone would have said that everything was fine. And even in Jeremiah's day, we'll look at Jeremiah here in just a minute, they were shouting out, uh, peace, peace, all is well, nothing is wrong, even though uh, Babylon was surrounding the city. Not a problem. We can serve two masters. 
we'll take a little bit of this and we'll take a little bit of that. Uh, and there they are, rejecting truth. Jeremiah chapter 8, speaking of Jeremiah, let's look at uh, starting at verse 5. Jeremiah 8, starting in verse 5, Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into battle. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow of Observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. How do ye say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribe is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. Jumping down to chapter 9, starting at verse 3. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in, my, in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. And they will deceive every one his neighbor, neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine inhabitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them, for how shall I do for the daughter of my people? Their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in heart he layeth his weight. Pretty uh, strong words there about how they were living after themselves, really. Again, living a lie, rejecting the word of God. Now, Second Timothy. Jump to the New Testament. Second Timothy chapter 3. How are things going to look in the last days? Why is it important that we know the truth, that we buy the truth, that we have the truth, that we live the truth? Well, what's it going to be like in the last days? This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, singing only one note. If you know the, the note chords, I don't know if you even call it note chords, but the fa, mi, so, those ones. Singing only me, right? Me, me, me. Me, me. I only know those because I saw the sound of music a long time ago. It just stuck with me. But anyways, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Wow. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as their, uh, theirs also was." ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. We got a lot of information available, a lot of supposed things that we could learn, but yet people not coming to the truth. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
verses 1 through 5. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. Remember, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Be turned away to fables. Now, fables, many times we, we think of fables as a, a nice story, a good story, maybe uh, with a moral. Have you ever read Aesop and his fables and, and think, well, what's wrong with fables? Well, the dangers of fables is this. They are feel-good stories. Maybe they are sprinkled with truth, but only sprinkled with truth. But what's the problem with fables? They have no authority. God's Word has authority. He says, what are we supposed to do? Well, do what he says. It has authority. Fables have no authorities. Fables are maybe at best suggestions. Hey, I like that one. I'll, I'll do that if I want or if it looks good for me or, or whatnot. Um, Peter even writes, he says, we didn't follow uh, cunningly devised fables when we gave you the truth. No, we gave you the truth, not fables. Fables, uh, in the end, are just stories. The Word of God, living and powerful. The truth. You know, I liked fables before I became a believer. I loved the fable that, that I found myself in, the one that said I was a good guy. The one that said, of course I was on my way to heaven. How could God reject a nice -a boy? You know, I was a nice boy. Not Italian. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I'm German. <laughs> no, I'm American. No, I'm a son of the Lord. <laughs> but anyways, what a fable. A fable that said I was good. I was good enough. And all the, the sins that we would really look on as the bad sins, well, I wasn't into those. I wasn't killing people. You know, lying, what's, what's so big about lying? What's so big about fornication? What's so big about uh, drunkenness? What's so big and just went on down the line? Yeah. But it, I was good, right? What a fable. What a fable. How many people are living in that fable? and need the light of Jesus Christ, need the truth. And to say, guess what? Guess what the end of that road is? Is destruction. What about fables in the church? Are there any fables in the church that one could believe? Uh, one big fable that was taught from a big mega church in Houston, I think it was maybe a year ago at this point, but they said, Worship songs, singing to the Lord, wasn't what God, God didn't need that. It wasn't really for him, but it was for you to feel good about yourself. What a fable. That goes back to being a lover of pleasure rather than being a lover of God. That this is about me and my feelings and how I come, that's a fable. And you could probably, or, and even thinking of many other fables that are even brought into the church. What was the problem? They could not endure sound doctrine. So you think of uh, Christian and faithful walking through Vanity Fair. Could they endure sound doctrine even at the hand of, of evildoers at them? Even when they're taken and roughed up? And it says that even for evil as they are given, they gave no evil back, but only kind words. Can we stand for truth even in the face of the mocking? You believe that there was a big flood that covered the, all the earth? You believe that uh, the Red Sea was parted? You believe, and just think of all those that want to come and say these are nothing but fables. And even in the church, I've heard it said, not this church, 
that, well, do, it doesn't really matter if the Red Sea wasn't parted. Maybe they did just walk across that sea of reeds that was three feet deep and, and then the whole Egyptian army got drowned in that. Don't know how that part happens, but, but what's the big deal? Well, what is the big deal? Because if God says that he cannot lie, uh, well, then that says he's a liar. And then what do you have in front of you? If he can't do that, how can he save you? He can't. But it's true. So again, as you comment to the truth, why is it important? Why should I buy the truth? Well, what does it look like without the truth? Now, let's look at the more positive. What, what does God say about the truth? Zechariah chapter 8. Almost the last book of the Old Testament, if that helps you out. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. It says, These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates, and let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath. For all these things, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. Hmm. God says he hates lying. He wants you to speak the truth. Proverbs also talks about that as well, that these are the things that God hates. Lying being one of those. Let's look at Psalm 51, verse 6. As David is coming to repent before the Lord for his sin. As he was, was caught in that and called out in that, Isaiah 51, verse 6, says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. So when David came and repented, was he blaming other people? Was he pointing to other things? Was, was he trying to, to hide behind uh, anything else? Which would be, again, being in darkness. No, he came against you and you alone have I sinned. Why? Because God wants truth in the inward parts. Because he already knows. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4. God already knows. He already sees. So what should we bring him? Bring him the truth. Uh, let's see. Truth provides protection. Check out Psalm 91. Verse 4, he says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. His truth. His truth provides protection. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with the truth. So you think of the truth as a belt, as you think of the, the Roman's uh, armor, as, as Paul's explaining that. What does that belt do? Well, it holds everything in place. The truth holds everything in place, just as that belt on the uh, soldier's uniform would do. Truth is also sanctifying. Jesus in his prayer, John 17, 17, he prays to the Father, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Also in John 18, truth being the, the clearest way to hear God's voice. So Jesus before Pilate, verse 37 Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. What an awesome promise that is. The clearest way to hear his voice. Jesus even said that he's the good shepherd and that his sheep hear his voice. Those who are of the truth hear his voice. Beautiful. Truth also keeps us from darkness and keeps us in the light. Go back and reread 1 John. 
and Second John and Third John, uh, in, the, in the last two letters, what is what is he write? That it uh, he's so joyful that he he sees that they're walking in the truth. What a joyous thing! What an amazing thing that you could receive someone's word and never have to doubt. Never have to question what they have to say. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? If we're in the light, in fellowship like that. Psalm 15. Psalm 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Answer, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Out of the mouth comes the abundance of the heart. Where you find your heart, there also is your treasure. Or did I get that backwards? Where your treasure is, there you'll find your heart. All right, now I'm confusing myself. Well, you know where it is, so you double check it. But out of the abundance of your heart, is truth pouring out? Who can abide in his tabernacle? Who can dwell in his holy hill? He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Why buy the truth? Easy answer again, because God says so. But look at the amazing promises that are in there. Look what would happen if you don't walk in the truth. It'd be like walking in a mirage, is how I equate that. Thinking that all these things are satisfying, all the lust of the flesh, all the lust of the eyes, all the pride of life somehow is bringing satisfaction and fulfillment. is a mirage. Sin is pleasurable for a season. Yes, that is true, but that's a season. What about eternity? That's a, a little different. Who can abide in the tabernacle? He that speaketh the truth in his heart. So, second question. How do I buy the truth then? What must I do to, to get this truth? If God says buy the truth, what do we do? Well, I think uh, there's some clues that we have in the Bible. Isaiah 55. Probably a familiar verse. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he ha that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which sat is satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. So I, I think, number one, how do I buy the truth? Well, we come to Jesus. Revelation 22, verse 17, talks about coming as well. As the Spirit cries out, come. Uh, let's read it real quick here. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So, looks like things are free, right? And, and we'll get into the cost in a minute here, but what must we do? Well, we need to come. We need to come to Jesus. How do I buy the truth? Well, I must come to him. In Hebrews and in Psalm 95, he says, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts and enter into his rest. Be diligent to enter into his rest. So, how do I buy the truth? Got to come to Jesus, number one. Number two, the simple thing, ask. What does uh, the Lord say in James 1.5? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. You let him ask. And it says that he will give liberally and without reproach. We come and ask. Luke 11.13, when Jesus is talking about... Um, 
uh, ask, seek, knock. He says, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? How much more? So you ask for a little and it says, how much more? How much more will he give to those that ask? Come to Jesus and we simply ask. What keeps us from asking? Pride. I don't need. I'm good enough. Uh, you know, what a, whatever the excuse is that we won't come and ask. Well, I already know that one. I don't need any help there. I'm already... No. Come to Jesus. Ask. And then simply receive, right? Because if you're given, you can't get anything unless you receive it. So receiving, which speaks of believing and doing, because believing and not doing is not really believing, but just kind of knowing. So receiving, receiving so that you can believe and do. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've been given the word of truth, what you should you be doing with it? But God says to study to show thyself approved. Now, I would like the, the, the osmosis trick of getting the word of God into my brain and heart. Just put the, the Bible on my head. You could wear it like a hat, see? And then it would just seep in, right? I think the Jews tried that with phylacteries. Big thing on your forehead or on your, your wrist or your hand. Uh, hey, I've got the Word of God on, in a box on my forehead. Well, how about in your heart? <laughs> Put it there. Study. Be diligent. Study. Show thyself to be approved. A workman that doesn't need to be shamed. How do you, uh, John chapter 2, right at the end of that chapter, when Jesus returns, how do you want to be seen when he returns? Approved. A workman in his work, doing what he has, rightly dividing the word of truth. Proverb 2, amazing promise in there. If, if you search those things out, if, then. If you search them out like you would treasure, then God will give you understanding, wisdom, and you'll have those things. Jesus says that the wise man is the one who hears his word and does his word. So again, receiving. Receiving these things into our lives because the foolish one is the one who hears his word and does nothing with it. Again, trying to walk in their own doing, their own making, and then it all falls apart. So, comes to the last point. What does it cost? So, buy the truth. God says, buy the truth and sell it not. Meaning, uh, don't dare give it away. Don't ever exchange it uh, for a lie. Don't exchange it for, for the mirage. So, free? Is it free? It seems like it's free. Um, what's the value of truth? How valuable do you think it is? If you read Psalm 119, you'll find in there repeated a few times about how God's word is greater than riches, greater than gold, greater than silver, greater than all those things. How valuable is his truth? So, free, not free, what's the cost of truth? Well, I think a great answer, John chapter 8. Turn there, if you will. And we're going to start at verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if, you, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So, how will we know the truth? Well, if we continue in his word, right? If we continue in his word, then we are his disciple. How do we become a disciple? Because I think that's the key right there about the cost of truth. Well, what does Jesus say about being his disciple? If any man would follow him, if anyone were to be his disciple, what do we do? Deny self, take up our cross, and follow him. So what's the cost? 
deny self because we can't buy anything. We can't buy salvation. We can't buy any of these things that he says come and buy because we have nothing to offer. We have no money that can buy it. We have no righteous deeds that can buy it. We have no strength. We have no wisdom. We have no nothing that can buy anything. That's why the cost is free in that sense. But what must we leave behind? <coughs> self. Deny self. Self-life must be laid down. If any man be his disciple, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, follow after him. That means self-will. Self-will, which is really pleasing self. Pleasing self is the root of all compromise with the world. When you put yourself above the truth, when you put yourself first, when you become a lover of pleasure, more than a lover of God. The self-life, which speaks of self-confidence, which is self-trust, self-effort, self-dependence. What's the cause of failure in our lives? Trusting self over Jesus. Not trusting in his wisdom. Not trusting in his strength. Not trusting in any of those things. But putting ourself above that. Self-exaltation, another point of self. Simply pride and jealousy. So the truth, Jesus says, the truth shall make you free. So you come by the truth, and the truth will make you free. So how are we free when we have the truth? When you have the truth, how does that make you free? Well, when is something truly free? I believe when it is doing what it was designed to do is when it's in its pure freedom. You know, let's think of a, a simple uh, analogy. Kitchen appliance. Think of whatever kitchen appliance you like the best. Maybe it's your coffee maker or um, stove or I don't know. You pick what it is. When is that object truly free? When it's fulfilling its purpose. What happens when it's going against its purpose? The gears are grinding a different way. Well, it's not working. It's not free. It's breaking down and it's causing everybody else problems, right? When is something truly free? When it's working in its purpose. It's fulfilling its purpose. So that leads us to what is our purpose? Why did God create us? And this brings us to great truth number three. Remember, three of them. There is a God. You are not him. What's the third great truth? Well, turn to uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 which says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What's that great promise number, or great truth number three? Why are we created? We are created for his pleasure. We are created to bring him glory. What does pride say about that? Uh-uh. I'm for me. It's about me. Life is about me. Pleasure, a uh, lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. But our purpose is to glorify God. What's that verse say? All things, all things created for his pleasure. For his pleasure. We are created. What's our purpose? When are we truly free? Well, when we're living in his will, when we're bringing him glory. When we are, when we know that we have been created, not we ourselves, for ourselves, but all for his pleasure, for his glory. God created these vessels, you and me, to pour out his divine fullness of his beauty, of his wisdom, and of his power. So the object of self, or we could call ourselves that vessel, a good picture that the Bible uses, is that we might bring uh, ourselves as an empty vessel unto God that he might pour into it his life. Let your light so shine. We have this treasure, this great treasure in these earthen vessels. Why? All, again, for his glory. So when self is turned to God... It's the, it is the glory of allowing God to reveal himself in us. 
and when we are fulfilling our purpose, the main reason why we were created. Living in that pure freedom of how he designed us, how he created us, because we're not fighting, we're not against, we're not in darkness, we're not doing any of those things, but walking in that true freedom of how we're designed. If you walk not how you're designed or for your purpose, that's where the fighting begins. That's where the things break down. That's where things go wrong. So self turned to God is the glory of allowing God to reveal himself in us. Self turned away from God is darkness. So the Bible is true when it says in me nothing good dwells. That fable that I so loved fable. Nothing in me uh, good dwells. So as we deny self, pick up cross, follow the way, the truth, the life, we follow after Jesus. Remember this, never for one moment expect to reach a stage in your life that you can say, I've got it. I don't need to deny myself anymore. I've got it all made. And we keep surrendering unto the Lord. Keep presenting our vessel empty. What did John the Baptist say? Less of me, more of him. That he'd be poured in so that his glory could be poured out. So what are the dangers as, as we wrap up about uh, this truth? What are the dangers to truth? Really forgetting these three simple truths. There is a God. I'm not him. And I've been created for his pleasure. I've been created uh, to bring him glory. Well, it leads to a sense of comfortableness that I believe then leads to a lack of zeal. We're told to be zealous for good works. He's prepared good works for us to walk in beforehand, before even time began. That we would be finding ourselves in these things. Lack of zeal leads to indifference. What does it matter? Who cares? Whatever. Leads to self-conceit. Hey, I'm, I'm good. Doesn't matter. Uh, and then leads to self-deceit. Who likes to be self Who likes to be deceived, number one? And then who likes to find out that they've been deceiving themselves? No one likes that. What a, what a horrible place to be, but what a good place to be as you fall upon the rock and are broken versus having that rock fall upon you. So the Church of Laodicea. Anyone ever admit that they're the Church of Laodicea? That's the other church, right? That's not us. Never, right? Well, the church of Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Now look how Jesus is identifying as he's coming to this church. Because they're self-deceived. The beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint that eye, thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So Jesus, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, comes to the church. What was their supposed state? How did they think they were? Well, they thought they were rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Have need of nothing. Have you ever found yourself in that state where you have need of nothing? Again, I'm good. All's well. They thought they were rich. How do you assess riches? 
Are you rich or poor in your prayer life? Are you rich or poor in your uh, devotion life? Are you rich or poor in your worship life? Are you rich or poor in your... And continue going down the list. How are your riches? Or lack thereof? Fun question to ask, right? But one that we don't like to answer all the time. How am I rich? Am I rich? What am I rich in? So, what happens? What's, uh, what's their true state? Well, their true state is that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Wow, what a state that is. The true and faithful witness that comes to them and exposes, shines the light. Why do men love uh, not come to the light? Because they love darkness. Don't want to expose because of pride. I don't want to show that I'm poor and miserable and, and naked. How embarrassing is that? Aren't those the worst dreams that you have? When you're there naked in front of everybody, like, oh, oh boy. Hopefully you don't have those dreams. Maybe just me, I don't know. Anyways, their true state. What's the remedy that Jesus has for them? What are they to do? They are to buy from him gold tried in the fire. They're to buy white raiments from him, an eye salve. Now, as I read that, it says buy gold. What's their true state? They're poor. And then I start thinking, how do I buy gold if I'm poor? What happens there? Again, we're not coming with what we have, right? Laying down. What's the cost? What must be laid down? Well, look at what they say. I am. I am rich. I am increased with goods. I am in need of nothing. Well, the I am attitude's got to go. Pride, self-confidence, self-worth, all that you think that are bound up in riches. Come, lay those down and buy the gold, the true gold from Jesus Christ. Buy white garments. Well, how do you buy clothing if you're poor and naked? You don't even have pockets to put your money in, would it? How are you supposed to buy this stuff? Again, it's not the cost, but what do you have to lay down? Your self-righteousness. How do you get those ra white raiments? Lay down the self-righteousness. If you're not naked, what's the best thing that you could ever put on by yourself? Filthy rags. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. The best that you can ever do? Filthy, disgusting, gross, dirty rags. I think I'd probably rather be naked than wear filthy rags. I don't know. But what do we do? Lay down self-righteousness self and come to Jesus and ask and receive. I salve. Quit longing, looking and longing at the world's things, the world's answers, the world's ways, the, all the temptations, all those things. Lay it all down. What's the cost? Well, self-trust. Self-trust must be laid down. If I can't see it, I can't believe it. What's the Bible tell us? Walk by faith, not by sight, which means believing the truth, what God says, and then walking in it, no matter what it looks like on the outside. But Lord, I can't see the way. I can't see how that's going to work out. I can't. That's okay. What's he say? If he says to walk in it, what are you to do? Walk in it. Walk in the truth. Just as John wrote to, to those, letter, the, those letters. Two John. Two John and three John, right? For second John and third John. I find, uh, well, let me read it. Because he says it way better than I try to sum it up. He says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in the truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Walking in the truth. What a joyous thing. God says, Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth. Can you buy it? It's free, right? Because we can come and we can receive freely. But what must be laid down? All our own ideas, thoughts, the self-life. Lay it down. And if you abide in his word, you are his disciple. And, if you're, and you'll know the truth. And if you know the truth, it will set you free. Who likes freedom? I like freedom. 
hopefully you like freedom, the true freedom, which is living as God created you for his pleasure, for his glory. What a true freedom that we can walk in.